sec def, and she came from her start in the Navy with uh, what is now NSOC and Fallon and later, later Center for Naval Analysis. Admiral Harry Harris is on the tip of the spear executing the strategy for rebalance in the Asia Pacific. Uh, Admiral Bill Gortney, our Fleet Forces Commander, who has taken the most strategic approach I've ever seen to attacking the readiness kill chain and keeping our forces afloat. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Admiral John Greenard, our CNO, who's out himself uh, on the pointy end today in Malaysia and the Philippines, meeting with counterparts and allies in the Asia Pacific. This man, who served four times in the N-8, has strategically and carefully and craftily guided the United States Navy through one of the toughest and most austere times of our history with sequestration and continuing resolutions. We are still afloat. We are still combat credible, and we are led by his sailing directions and his navigation plan. And I think that's very strategic. Just because you take off your uniform doesn't mean you're a strategist anymore. The strategist emeritus of the United States Navy is Jim Stavridis, Admiral Jim Stavridis, my former boss and mentor from SACUR in uh, Europe. Admiral Stavridis has become the chairman of the board of the Naval Institute. He never left us. He still mentors the Rat Pack for a strategy and strategists in the Navy, of which I'm proudly a part, and many of you are too. And so, all that said, I think as we draw down from two land wars, this is not only going to be the maritime decade, but it's gonna be the maritime century. And what you're gonna to hear today is a very important part and piece of that pie in our maritime strategy. What about China? Uh, is China the panda or the dragon? And you're going to hear some differing views about that today. Uh, it's a very important assumption in the maritime strategy. And I'll tell you a little secret. All week, I've been walking around with the final draft of the maritime strategy in this bag. The final draft. I've gone to a lot of these uh, colloquium and meetings and uh, discussion sections, and I've made some pen and ink changes because Vice Admiral Michelle Howard and Admiral Bill McQuilkin and I are responsible for delivering this to the CNO in the spring. So I'm a strategy sleeper cell amongst you. And I'd be willing to hear from any of you on what you think ought to go in the final draft of the maritime strategy. Can't show it to you yet, because we have to wait and see what uh, happens with the quadrennial defense review. But we will be aligned, and we will be out there, and we'll be moving forward with our next strategy. One of the questions we're asking is, in 2007, when we wrote the cooperative strategy for the 21st century, China wasn't mentioned. Should it be in this strategy, in the context of a global purveyor of security or a potential adversary? And you'll get a chance to answer that rhetorical question yourself today. As we navigate the relationship with other navies, including China, the CNO has taken the lead in establishing a number of TE Lawrences within the N35 Plans and Policy and Strategy Organization in uh, OPNAV. Uh, Rear Admiral Doug Van Lett, who was our former defense attache in Moscow, fluent in Russian, is Lawrence of Russia, appropriately so. He took Admiral Cherkov around on his counterpart visit and spoke primarily in fluent Russian to him his entire time in the United States. That builds mutual trust, respect, and partnerships. It goes a long way. So last summer, when President Obama and President Xi met in Sunnylands, there were some things that came out of that meeting, five pillars for a new relationship between our two countries, tabled by President Xi. Equality and a great power relationship, mutual respect, a win-win for both parties, mutual trust, comprehensiveness, and inclusiveness. And out of that, an agreement to talk about confidence-building measures and rules of behavior at sea. So when I got to my job last August, the CNO asked me to be the lead for OPNAV on confidence-building measures, rules of behavior in partnership with PACOM, the PACOM commander and his staff, and under the umbrella of leadership of the Department of Defense and the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Dave Helvey. So I became Lawrence of China. And it's very important uh, that we have this discussion with our Chinese counterparts on the norms, standards of behavior, consistent with international institutions, conventions, and treaties that China is a part of. The rules of the road, they agree to it. The UN Convention on Law of the Sea, they've signed it. We haven't, but we agree to all the principles that are in there. The Chicago Convention on Operations of Civil and Military Air and the Maritime Airspace. CUES, the Code for Unexpected Encounters at Sea. So we've got to find the common ground and figure out how we're going to operate 
in this big ocean in the Western Pacific together and peacefully and without incident, without miscalculation or misperception. What qualifies me to do this? Two things. One, I am an Olmsted scholar. I'm not fluent in, in uh, Mandarin, but that's the carrot side of the house. I can see the views of the guy sitting on the other side of the table through the lens that he sees the world. That's what I'm trained to do as an Olmsted scholar. Secondly, the stick side of the house is at the time I was named, I was the senior steering group director of Air Sea Battle. That scares a lot of people, including the Chinese. That's the stick. Uh, it's been a fascinating adventure. In the last five months, I've been to China twice, uh, once with uh, Captain Dale Relash. I was the escort officer for Admiral Wu Sheng Li, six days with uh, the CNO of the Chinese Navy, joined the Chinese Navy in 1968, 50 years of active service, seven years as CNO. This is a man who calls Admiral Mullen, Admiral Keating, and Admiral Roughhead his closest mm -hmm. personal American friends, and he means that because he still talks to them. He's fiercely proud of his Navy, of China's rise in the maritime. Uh, he's seven years as CNO, and he will probably remain on active duty and potentially outlast Admiral Greenert in his second tour. And so Admiral Greenert has gotten to know him as well. Those six days, I was with him from sunup to sundown. We started here in San Diego. We toured Jefferson City, the submarine. We went to uh, USS Carl Vinson, flew off the deck in an SH-60, landed underway on the literal combat ship Fort Worth doing 40 knots off the coast of San Diego, brought him back. The next day, we got in a V-22, and we flew down to Camp Pendleton, and we were Lieutenant General Tulin, one of our earlier speakers' guests at Camp Pendleton with all of his Marines for the better part of a day, and then back to Washington. Admiral Wu is intelligent, engaging, and calculating, and he's got a very dry sense of wit. Those six days represented a continuum of the greatest and the most challenging chess match of my career with a foreign officer. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. He brought with him five major commanders, the CEO of Lao Ning, their carrier, Zhao Zhang, fluent in English, ed educated in the UK. Captain Dai, their top gun, a Chinese maverick, no kidding, even looks like Tom Cruise. First guy to catch the tail hook on their carrier. He was invited to the tail hook conference by Admiral Keating when he met him. Uh, Captain Wong, the third, fleet, or third flotilla commander of the East China Sea Fleet. Uh, Captain Dong, a submarine squadron commander and a Marine Brigade combat commander. So as a counterpart visit uh, to Admiral Wu's time in the States, Dale and I went to Beijing and uh, Guangzhou and Doxidao with Admiral Ferguson. You'll hear from him later today. Uh, red carpet. Uh, we toured the Lu Yong uh, DDG. We got underway on their brand new Corvette. We sailed to their submarine base in Doxidao, and we toured the Yuan Air Independent Propulsion Submarine. They let us take pictures of everything but below decks on the submarine. It was spectacular. So that was a high in the relationship. As soon as we left, on the 23rd of November, China declared an air defense identification zone. That was a setback. And you saw the results of that in the press and the vice president's visit to Beijing. Shortly thereafter, on the 5th of December, the Kalpans incident between Liao Ning, the carrier, with Zhao Zhang, the captain who visited the United States on the bridge, and our commanding officer in a discussion or disagreement over operations with due regard by our vessel in international waters. And you saw how that played out, and we'll talk about that today. It did not preclude the defense policy consultative talks the following uh, uh, week in Beijing, headed by Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Helvey. I went with him. And we agreed to the mill-to-mill -mill engagement plan for 2014 with our Chinese counterparts, 20 percent more than we did last year. That's progress, including their participation for the first time ever in RIMPAC. Now, let me introduce my team. James Holmes, professor from uh, Naval War College, is going to give you a strategic overview. He is the co-author of Red Star Rising in the Pacific. I was on Admiral Greenard's transition team three years ago. He told me to read two books, Monsoon by Kaplan and Red Star Rising by Holmes. That's why he's here. He's an expert in his field. Captain Jim Fennell, Pack Fleet N2, spectacular intelligence officer. He was here last year. He got your juices flowing. You ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till he comes up and talks today. Dave Adams, brilliant submariner, former CEO of the Santa Fe, speechwriter for Admiral Mullen, commander of the uh, PRT in coast in Afghanistan, uh, the provincial reconstruction team. He was mentioned in Secretary Gates' book, Duty, as the guy who had the model 
to run a PRT. Uh, Dave's got a bronze star. He's now the head of the Commander's Initiatives Group at 7th Fleet for Admiral Robert Thomas. He's a prolific author. He's got another one coming out in proceedings soon. You'll enjoy listening to him. Stu Belt, he's our lawyer. He's an international lawyer, works for uh, OJAG in the Pentagon. He has done six MMCAs, which are the Military Maritime Consultative Talks with the Chinese. He understands them. He understands their vernacular. He can tell you the difference between their view of freedom of navigation and freedom of passage. And Dale Relash. Dale is, uh, uh, I joked with him, I said, Dale, you're the last guy, so you're like Harvey Keitel in Pulp Fiction. You're the cleaner. So you're going to bring this all together today. Dale is an extremely strategic officer, strategic thinker, just like I talked about in the beginning. He's one of our best and brightest. He's going to Third Fleet to work for Admiral Floyd. He's been working for CNOs, uh, the last two CNOs, as the head of their uh, Pacific, uh, uh, the NAPAG organization, which is uh, the uh, organization that deals with Asia Pacific, for the, uh, specifically for the CNO. Uh, Dale's been over there to China many times, and uh, he'll tell you what it's like from an intelligence officer's perspective. He served as the China desk at ONI before he came in to work for Admiral Greener. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me just turn it over to them. Thank you. Thanks, Admiral. I find myself in the unusual position of being the uncontroversial one on the panel. I guess that's what happens when you get matched up with uh, Jim Fennell for an event such as this. Admiral Fogo has sent me the impossible task of describing the strategic challenge China poses in five to seven minutes. Since a complete rundown is clearly impossible, let me instead posit a few ways China could get the best of America in the strategic competition presently underway. Such an excursion could be the beginning of wisdom. Asia watchers sometimes contend that China cannot match the United States and its allies militarily. Some point to Chinese hardware, claiming it lags decades behind our own. Other commentators much, make much of raw budgetary numbers. Because the United States outspends the next X countries combined, they say we're number one for the foreseeable future. Basically, who spends the most wins. We can all get at the big foamy white finger. We're number one. So, such observations could be true, but not especially relevant to the competition. In fact, the godfather of strategic theory, Carl von Clausewitz, sees three ways a lesser competitor can ace out a stronger one. It can do so while using it little, if any, force and without unduly disrupting the regional order. It merely needs to compete smart. First way to win. A weaker contestant can render, render its opponent unable to carry on the struggle. It can throw down his armed forces or perhaps unseat his regime and thus win the right to dictate terms. Does Beijing want to fight? No, hardly. We make much of Asia's preference for winning without fighting, but in fact, no sane government relishes the cost the hardships and the uncertainty of armed conflict. So it's, a, it's, it's fair to say no one wants war. Nonetheless, it behooves China to build a maritime force capable of defeating the largest allied contingent it's likely to face. That's how Mahan, another one of our great theorists, measures the adequacy of such a force. Think about it. The PLA has the luxury of concentrating all its forces and effort against a fraction of the U.S. armed forces, which, as I hardly need to tell this audience, are dispersed around the globe performing a variety of missions. So it stands to reason that PLA forces could be stronger where it counts, even if they remain weaker overall. There's precedent for this in our own history. Mahan, for example, believed that a modest U.S. Navy battle fleet standing astride the sea lanes connecting Great Britain with its possessions in the Caribbean would have granted President Madison immense diplomatic leverage in the War of 1812. He thought it might have even deterred war simply because the U.S. Navy could hold British interests at risk. Mahan went on to urge the United States to make itself number one in the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico at the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. And so it did. A lesser fleet, it seems, can make itself locally supreme in the waters that matter most to it. What was good for America a century ago could be good for China today, so long as it confines its interests to nearby waters and skies. The PLA can bring shore-based fire support, tactical aircraft, a panoply of anti-ship missiles, and so forth, to bear hundreds of miles distant from the mainland coast. So it's not just the PLA Navy that can concentrate in waters important to Beijing. It's the Navy plus a power, a land-based arm of Chinese sea power. China's is a maritime as opposed to a naval strategy through and through. 
so Beijing can hope to mass superior might at the decisive place, place at the decisive time and to win should combat prove unavoidable. Clausewitz would applaud to this logic of local superiority as would Mahan. So that's one way to win. Second way to win. Clausewitz observes that one competitor can win by convincing the other he can't. Here, let's consult a living strategist, Henry Kissinger. Kissinger notes that one competitor can deter another by displaying potent capabilities, by dis demonstrating the resolve to use them, and by persuading that opponent that he will indeed use them under certain well-defined circumstances. So deterrence, it seems, is a product of force, will, and the opponent's belief in our force and will. If that opponent, opponent is sufficiently impressed, he will refrain from the actions that we want to deter. The same might be said of coercion. If we, in effect, can appoint a gun at a competitor, and if he believes we'll pull the trigger under certain circumstances, he may well take the positive action that we wish him to take. So he may do or refrain from doing what we want simply because we persuade him he's unlikely to win. That's Clausewitz's second way to win. Third way to win is a variant of the second. Clausewitz maintains that one competitor can prevail over another by, convinc by convincing that adversary that even if able to win, he can't win at a cost acceptable to him. Strategic competition, then, is in a real sense a head game. Clausewitz notes that the, that the value of the political object determines the magnitude and the duration of the effort a belligerent ex expense to obtain that object. It determines how many lives, how much national treasure, and how many other resources that contestant puts into the effort and for how long. The value of the object amounts to the price we're prepared to, prepared to pay for our goals. Now we can shape an antagonist co cost-benefit calculus as well. If I can drive up the cost of an endeavor to him by making it too resource intensive, by dragging it out, or both, cost-benefit logic should prompt him to relinquish his goals. I will have raised the price above what he's willing to pay based on his own political calculations. If he abides by cost-benefit logic, he should eventually cut his losses and abandon the effort. So you see where I'm going with this. By fielding impressive anti-access capabilities, the PLA can attempt to persuade Washington that the ends, including the defense of allies such as Japan or Taiwan, aren't worth the expense. It can try to dishearten our leaders, convincing them the U.S. and its allies cannot prevail within the Asian contested zone. And if all else fails, it can hope to make itself locally superior for long enough to fulfill its operational and strategic objectives. America, it hardly needs restating, is a maritime nation reliant on its Navy, its Marine Corps, and its Coast Guard for its standing in the world. In effect, then, Beijing can ask President Obama or, who happens to op or whoever happens to occupy the White House, is your alliance with Japan or Taiwan or the Philippines or whoever worth losing a major part of the Pacific fleet on which your superpower status depends? That's a serious question, and the answer might be no. It depends on where these things fit into the U.S. strategic pecking order. Or our leadership might hesitate in the times of trouble, granting Beijing an operational or strategic pause. That pause might be long enough for China to accomplish its goals, presenting Washington and the world with a fait accompli, whether in the Taiwan Strait, East China Sea, or elsewhere. So let's not take too much solace in the notion that China lags behind America in defense spending, in military technology, or in other indices of power. Even if true, China would hardly be the first weaker power to defeat the strong if it puts its home court advantage to good use. Indeed, history is littered with cases in which lesser but imaginative and determined adversaries have done just that. So in a nutshell, that is how I size up the Chinese strategic challenge. Thank you. Thanks, James. Jim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before beginning my remarks, I want to take a moment and thank the U.S. Naval Institute, AFSEA, for inviting me to speak at AFSEA West for the third time. It's indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be invited, especially with this great panel, and especially given my remarks from last year. I anticipated that after last year's plain direct assessment of China's expansionism, I might never be invited back to this forum. But I was, and here I am. No one likes it, I told you so, but I will ask you to indulge me as my remarks will have a bit of the I told you so in them. As we witness the PRC continue its maritime expansionism campaign over the course of the last year. It's not just Beijing's words, but it's the actions of the PLA Navy and the China Coast Guard that are responsible for upsetting the peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region. For instance, last year I told you 
China is, quote, taking control of maritime areas that have never before been administered or controlled in the last 5,000 years by any regime called China, and that the People's Republic is now doing it in an area up to 900 miles from the mainland, as close as dozens of miles off the coasts of other nations. That speech was, well, it was provocative, even controversial, in January of 2013. I even half apologized in it for the bluntness of describing China's expansionism as well-being expansionism. It sounded so aggressive then to simply state the facts. What a difference a year makes. As it turns out, China's Navy and civil maritime organizations have more than validated our concerns. As a senior U.S. government of official recently stated, there is growing concern that China's pattern of behavior in the South China Sea reflects an incremental effort by China to assert control over the area contained in the so-called Nine Dash Line, despite the objections of its neighbors and despite the lack of any explanation or apparent basis under international law regarding the scope of the claim itself. Chinese analysts now readily and publicly admit to Admiral Wu Sheng Li's campaign of maritime expansionism. And President Xi Jinping openly promotes China's maritime ambitions as an essential part of his China dream. Last year's provocative assessment now seems obvious, even conservative, and not forward-leaning at all. In January of 2013, Chinese warplanes were daily making simulated attack runs straight at Japan or Japanese naval forces within the East China Sea. The activity was highlighted when Chinese bombers flew strike training missions into the Philippine Sea, a first in PLA history. On the 29th of January 2013, President Xi Jinping delivered a hard-edged speech to the Politburo, and described by some as reflecting a new militancy in which he effectively ruled out compromise on territorial and security issues. At the same time, 20 South Sea Fleet warships conducted a five-day anti-air attack and anti-nuclear exercise in the South China Sea, while three warships from Qingdao to the went to the Philippine Sea for combat dr drills, including, quote, the protection of maritime rights. By the way, the protection of maritime rights is a Chinese euphemism for coerced seizure of coastal rights of China's neighbors. The next week in the East China Sea, Japan said a Chinese warship locked its fire control radar onto a Japanese warship. China denied it for a month and then admitted it occurred, but said that it was not a danger since the range between the two ships was too close for a weapons system. Seriously, you just can't make this stuff up. While we are confident in the capabilities of Japan's self-defense forces, we appreciated their extraordinary restraint throughout this period and we support Japan's call for diplomacy and crisis management procedures in order to avoid a miscalculation and dangerous incident. It's important to lower tensions, to turn down the rhetoric, and to exercise caution and restraint in this sensitive area. In March of 2013, as Beijing prepared for its National People's Congress, or NPC, the MPC provided a high-profile platform to announce many of China's long-planned changes to support its expansion. Principally, the National People's Congress re-reorganized China's civil fleet, subordinating all fisheries and law enforcement cutters from other agencies into a single new organization called China Coast Guard, which is still under the State Oceanic Administration, the civil bureau fronting Beijing's expansionist activities. Tensions in the South and East China Sea have deteriorated with the Chinese Coast Guard playing the role of antagonists, harassing China's neighbors while PLA Navy ships, their protectors, conduct port calls throughout the region promising friendship and cooperation. We have heard many senior PLA officers say the PLA Navy and the Chinese Coast Guard efforts are not coordinated. This is simply not true. This campaign is being meticulously coordinated from Beijing. The NPC also allocated $1.6 billion for improvements to disputed South China Sea outposts. The PLA vigorously is developing ports, airfields, water purification, communications and surveillance capabilities at its, at its military occupations in the disputed paracels, and continued subsidizing civil activities in order to create the impression of a civil habitation at the notional Sansha Prefecture in Hainan Province. Meanwhile, 
China described efforts by other nations to improve the habitability at their outposts as egregious provocations and responded with threats. On the day that the NPC closed last year, a PLA Navy amphibious assault ship and three combatants sailed from southern China for what was again described as rights protection training. The warships first conducted island seizure drills in the Paracels, then steamed to James Shoal, 60 miles from Malaysia, 900 miles from China, where they paused to drop a border marker while the crew swore oaths to defend China's southernmost territory. Then they broadcast it globally, in English. The PLA Navy South Sea Fleet commander conducted this humiliating provocation during Malaysia's week-long biannual exercise, defense exercise, or exhibition known as Lima. The PLA Navy described this as normal. And you know what? The PLA Navy conducted another oath-taking ceremony again on 26 January 2014. Sure sounds normal to me. In the second half of 2013, the character of China's naval training changed focus towards realistic maritime combat operations on the high seas. In addition to their long-standing task to restore Taiwan to the mainland, we witnessed the massive amphibious and cross-military region exercise, Mission Action 2013, and concluded that the PLA has been given a new task, to be able to conduct a short, sharp war to destroy Japanese forces in the East China Sea, followed what can only be expected, a seizure of the Senkakus or even the southern Ryukus, as some of their academics write about. The PLA also trained to deter or destroy any attempted interference by the U.S. Naval and Air Forces during exercise Jidong or Mobility 5. This unprecedented exercise focused on integrating surface ships, submarines, and aircraft from all three fleets and land-based missile forces in a multidisciplinary counter-intervention warfare strategy. In all, last year, we counted in Chinese press nine instances of PLA Naval Surface Action Group and Air Forces steaming and flying into the Western Pacific to practice striking naval targets. The amount of time PLA Navy Surface Action Groups trained in the Philippine Seas now rivals that of the U.S. Navy. In addition to the PLA's counter-intervention strategy, the PLA in November heavily publicized its development of their submarine ballistic missile capability. A Global Times piece in English was filled with helpful facts like, because Midwestern states of the United States are sparsely populated, in order to increase the lethality, our nuclear attacks should mainly target the key cities on the west coast of the United States, such as Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego. The state-endorsed newspaper went on to point out that the 12 JL-2 nuclear warheads carried by one single Type 094 SSBN can kill and wound 5 to 12 million Americans. Imagine the outrage if a similar statement had been made from any U.S. media outlet. Imagine the outrage. And to put this in issue into perspective, I fully expect the first, type, uh, first ever Type 094 submarine launched ballistic missile pat patrol will occur in 2014. Then on a quiet day in late November, the Friday before Thanksgiving, as Admiral Fogo has mentioned, the PLA abruptly declared an air defense identification zone in the East China Sea. PRC government and media propaganda statements followed quickly, declaring this aid is gave them a right to take quote-unquote, emergency measures against non-compliant aircraft in international airspace, even aircraft that were not vectored at the Chinese mainland. This unilateral action has been called out by senior U.S. Defense and State Department officials as being, quote, a provocative act and a serious step in the wrong direction, unquote. As I told you so last year, this year or next, I expect the People's Republic of China will declare an aid is in the South China Sea. This may be combined with what my senior analyst, Mr. Barney Moreland, has assessed uh, may be a vessel traffic management system for surface ships, as the PLA declared its intent to control all ships and aircraft within the South China Sea in a published essay shortly after declaring it was all part of a new Chinese prefecture. Evidence for the veracity of Barney's assessment was made manifest last month when China declared its right to control all fishing in the South China Sea. 
While the PLA has long coveted an airfield in the Spratly Islands, we soon expect to see their new aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, being used to back up their campaign to secure their neighbor's coastal state rights in the South China Sea. And you will recall, as Admiral Fogo mentioned, China asserted this, uh, uh, you will recall last month, China asserted that simply having the aircraft carrier at sea gave them a right to harass the USS Calpins, who was some 50 miles away from their carrier at the beginning of the incident. And more on that issue in the question and answer period if you'd like. As I come to a close, I'd like to bring you some strategic context. Admiral Lu Wa Ching is known in Vietnam as the commander of the massacre of 70 Vietnamese sailors standing in waist deep water at Chigua Reef in 1988. In the West, Admiral Lu is known as the commander of the massacre of his countrymen at Tiananmen Square in 1989. However, in China, Admiral Lu is known as the father of the Chinese Navy. And in 1983, he stated their vision. He said, China will establish naval supremacy within the first island chain by 2010, turning it into an inland sea. By 2020, China will ensure naval supremacy within the second island chain. And by 2040, China will have the power to contain the dominance of the U.S. Navy in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. I think they're ahead of schedule, don't you? The, the PRC five years ago embarked on a $6.6 .6 billion project to increase China's propaganda footprint around the world. Though we have our own intelligence resources, all the facts I'm providing you are published in Chinese Communist Party funded and approved open source publications. Beijing has paid dearly to bring this information to you. They're proud of it. They think it's normal. I don't know how China's intentions could be any more transparent. And remember, I told you so. Thanks for your time. All right, thanks, Jim. Like I said, very provocative. I see a lot of you taking notes. I know you're gonna want to ask questions. So, gentlemen, we have three to go. Uh, let's wrap up your presentations by the top of the hour, leave at least 15 minutes for questions. Dave Adams from the Seventh Fleet Perspective on the pointy end of the spear. Dave. Hey, it's a great honor to be here today and to get a chance to talk a little bit about the operations in the Pacific uh, that are going on and to talk about China. Uh, thank you to AFSEA and the Naval Institute, to Ken Snyder and to Vice Admiral Daly. Uh, this is an important organization. I don't see him out there, but I just have to mention Fred Rainbow, uh, who really has meant to, he's overrunning his education program, I think. Uh, if you haven't seen what he's done with that program, it speaks a lot for Fred and look at all the young people he's educating and mentoring. And so a lot of us uh, who've written in proceedings and we're encouraged to write and dare to write and speak our opinions and uh, participate in the debate, he's a big part of that. And I'll try to stay as true to that as I can. And uh, as I start off, I'd just like to say the positions I'll, I'll, I'll articulate today are meant to be thought provoking, not, not necessarily to be the answers. And they're certainly not the position of the US 7th Fleet or the Department of the Navy or the Department of Defense. What, a, what a, you know, shaping the maritime strategy is what we're here about today. So I'll be interested in talking about that. And what about China? Uh, what, a, what about China? How do we have a strategy for China? Um, Alfred Thayer Mahan, in a book that we don't read enough called The Problem of Asia, said, a China with unlimited resources but unconstrained in the use of those resources is a central problem of Asia. And that's the problem that we're talking about today. How will they use all the military power that Jim Fennell talks about? And what will our response be to that, to that power? Um, what is our strategy? Well, we all know that we were adrift strategically since for several decades before in 2007 we published our cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power. Uh, Secretary Lehman in the pages of proceedings called that a bravura performance. Others said the strategy was too interested in avoiding conflict and not enough about answering the challenges of it. No one expected that strategy to be so quickly overshadowed. It has been overshadowed by two things which people call non-strategies, and I hope that uh, Admiral Fogel, I know he's been working on it, has the answers in his bag. I'm looking forward to reading them. them. But it's been overshadowed by air-sea battle and by rebalance or pivot to the Pacific two non-strategies that are driving the strategic debate, both of which has problems. One is too overly conventional in its thinking, air-sea battle, and the other one is challenged in execution because we continue to have Middle East whiplash and it's very difficult to execute that, 
to execute that strategy. And from the debate is gone for some really important things from that 21st century strategy, which is preventing wars is as important as fighting them. Demissed from our lexicon is a discussion of cooperative maritime partnerships across the world to answer the challenges of irregular, catastrophic, and disrupted challenges. Sometimes I think it's forgotten what Secretary Gates said about we have to be prepared to fight the wars we're gonna fight, not the wars we want to fight. Back in vogue is the mis misguided idea that high-end, large-scale warfare is both the most pressing problem and our panacea. And we have to be careful about these things as we think about China. It reminds me of an article in 1990 in Proceedings by Neil Golightly. It was called Correcting Three Strategic Mistakes. He wrote it in 90, right before the fall of the wall. He's now a vice president for Exxon, but he went on to be the speechwriter to Colin Powell. He was a speechwriter for Secretary Dalton. He said, we're gonna make three strategic mistakes. He said, first, believing that a conventional defense is safer than nuclear deterrence. Second, he says, be, being myopically focused on large-scale warfare and preparing for that. And third, <coughs> ignoring peripheral threats, like the tanker war in the Gulf, and specifically terrorism. His advice should have been heeded then and is even more relevant now. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit in the context of China. Um, Jim talked about the JL2. They talked about any conflict that we were to have for China, and you can read Nixon's book, would be cataclysmic. Great powers, these are great powers who have nuclear weapons. And the absence of a dialogue on strategic deterrence and ensuring that our strategic deterrence is number one in the world, and there's an article by Admiral Bruner and Mike Cockey in this month's proceedings that tells how important it is. And that will also constrain any conflict if it were to happen. Any concept that thinks about uh, China attacking U.S. bases and uh, the, the territory of our treaty allies is dangerous. And any concept that talks about attacking mainland China is dangerously escalatory. And a lack of acknowledgement that nuclear deterrence has undermined uh, the end of, of large-scale conventional conflicts between great powers endangers millions of lives. So first of all, strategic deterrence remains important. And as Jim talked about more provocatively, it is very clear that the Chinese are pursuing a strategic deterrent capability to deter us, and that will limit the conflict. And that gets us to the second uh, point that I'd like to say. We have to, Brent Scrocroft recently talked about in an article, we have to hedge against the major war. But at the same time, we can't buy every system to do that. So it's very unlikely that we're gonna have a major war we have to hedge against that, but at the same time, we have to realize that's probably not the war we're gonna fight. The Army and Marine Corps tell us this, General McMasters tells us this in the New York Times, I'm not sure we're listening. Uh, what is the war we're gonna fight? We also have to think hard about Navy culture uh, when we do this. The last good work on that was Carl Builder and the Masks of War. And it talks about how the Navy culture is one that envisions itself primarily in conducting sweeping fleet actions across the Pacific. That is not the war that we're going to fight. It's not the one I believe we're gonna fight. And we have to be cautious that selling the United States Navy on that concept is akin to selling drinks to an alcoholic. And somebody is gonna to have to pay the tab. And at the same time, China is pursuing a hybrid, and Jim talked about this, they've read the literature, they're pursuing a hybrid approach to warfare, not the big war, but it could be high tech, hybrid, low-tech, legal, financial, cyber, and we're already losing that war in the South China Sea today. And we're not focused on that in our, in our strategy, that peripheral conflict. And if we've learned nothing since 9-11 is relegating peripheral threats to a secondary challenge to the United States can be a debilitating strategic mistake. So with that, I would tell you there's a few things we need to do. Uh, and this is certainly not the entire strategy. We need to hedge against the big fight. We have to realize that our undersea advantage and our advantage in the air greatly outpaces uh, that of China. Jim might disagree with me, but I will tell you that that's not the fight they want and they're going to lose if they go that way. We need to ensure that we maintain those advantages and that we have adequate weapons inventories and weapons in those areas. Two, we need to make the rebalance real in order to back up our allies 
by ensuring we have adequate carrier presence in the Pacific. We don't get too uh, thrown on the day-to-day. 1-0 -day. carrier presence would be nice. Uh, we need to ensure we have enough submarines in the Pacific, which may not be solved by building more submarines. We need to think unconventionally, like positioning more submarines in the Pacific. We did that 10 years ago with Guam. There was a lot of resistance. Can we put them in other places in the Pacific and really think through that? There will be a lot of opposition in order to do that. But I think we could do that, and that would send a major signal. And we also need to increase the number of crew des units and all of our other units uh, in doing that, and we need to be able to conduct electromagnetic maneuver warfare. All the time, we also need to make sure our strategic deterrent is a number one priority and that the strategic dialogue is occurring between us and China so neither side is, gets ourselves in a position where there's miscalculation, which, as Kissinger put in his book, would be cataclysmic to the world. But then, in conclusion, there's the other side of the coin. And you have to understand that Asia's problem is Asia's problem. The United States can lead and we can support, but we cannot solve the problem of Asia. The deep hatreds that occur, the rivalries, everyone has to become adults and have to be willing to go to the table and negotiate. We have to help the nations build the capacity to defend themselves which we're not very good at. Those are the lessons of Afghanistan and Iraq we need to bring out to the Pacific. We have no white holes in the Pacific, hardly. If, uh, I remember when Admiral Mullen was asked, hey, what is uh, the biggest problem with the U.S. military when he was the CNO, and he said the Army. Today, we should say it's the Coast Guard, and we're going to have to fund the Coast Guard and not to do their conventional missions, but to come and help with the white hole problem out in the Pacific. We have to think unconventionally, hedge against the big war, and be ready to win a hybrid war, which we're not even thinking about. And if we lose a war, if the Navy has its Vietnam, it's going to be a dirty, hybrid, paramilitary war in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, now for the lawyers, one comment uh, I want to share with you from Admiral Wu Sheng Li when we were talking about things. He had a lot of asks, things that he wanted to do uh, with the United States Navy, as did we. And I said, sir, I'm going to have to run that by the lawyers. We have lots of lawyers. He goes, no, Fogo Shangzhong, because I'm an honorary general in the PLA Navy. Uh, he said, you have lots of rules, just like us. So the way they view the world is through rules. We view it through uh, legal jurisprudence and uh, what our JAGs tell us. Stu, give us your perspective. Thanks, Admiral Fogo. I appreciate that. And I'd like to build on, on Dave's a uh, couple of his themes. One is, is the cooperative strategy, and, and two is this theme of Asia responsibility. I need to emphasize that these are my own comments and do not reflect the official position of the United States Navy. I want to make four points today from what I'll call a, a somewhat legal perspective. First is that international law is an essential tool to resolve some of these complex issues, particularly in the East in South China Sea. These issues, these complex issues, can be grouped into what I would like to call three baskets. One basket is disputes over territorial claims to islands. Think Senkakus, think Spratleys, think the Paracels. The second group of issues is over excessive assertions of maritime jurisdiction. Think of declaring EEZs for mere rocks or China's nine-dash line, which covers most of the South China Sea. And then the third is competition over natural resources. Think of, of hydrocarbons and fish. I strongly believe that the emphasis by the United States and others in the region on a rules-based approach is the best course to restore stability and to maintain peace as these disputes will inevitably play out. This rules-based narrative was highlighted by Secretary of State Clinton in 2010 in Hanoi, and I'm sure many people in this room remember sort of that moment where she stated that the U.S. has a national interest in the freedom of navigation, open access to Asia's maritime commons, and respect for international law in the South China Sea. And this theme has been repeated by uh, successive uh, secretaries of state and defense. My second point is that there already are extant structures and mechanisms in place that permit this rules-based approach to work. These include institutional bodies such as ASEAN, treaty law such as the Law of the Sea Convention, 
and international tribunals. And one of the bright spots in international law jurisprudence is the ongoing arbitration between the Philippines and China. This case was filed more than a year ago by the Philippines and they seek to use arbitration proceedings under the Law of the Sea Convention to do two things, challenge China's nine dash line as well as China's claim to maritime entitlements from mere rocks or low tide elevations. The panel will likely make a ruling in mid-2015, so keep your eyes open for that. The second thing I would say about that uh, proceeding is China's refusal to participate in this under Annex 7 of the Law of the Sea Convention underscores the need for all regional actors to continue to embrace this rules-based approach for conflict resolution. My third point is that actions do matter, actions and words. I believe the following specific steps would be particularly helpful in promoting international law norms. First, all countries should clarify, in that region, should clarify their maritime claims. And I would just note here that Vietnam and the Philippines have done a good job in the last couple of years to try to perfect their claims. Second, as Assistant Secretary of State Danny Russell just called for in congressional testimony, China should clarify to the international community precisely what its nine dash line means or adjust it to bring it into accordance with international law. Third, the code of conduct should be worked on with more alacrity. And fourth, and this is a very broad statement, but countries should respect the sovereignty of other nations, whether meeting them in international waters, in the air, or in their respective capitals. This respect for sovereignty would militate against declaring ADISs without consultation and without recognizing the status of state aircraft in the zone. And lastly, from a U.S. perspective, I think it's vital and critical that freedom of navigation and overflight is not eroded, particularly in the area of the South China Sea. This specifically applies to China's efforts to allocate a security interest in the exclusive economic zone. And just to be clear, when the EEZ was established under the Law of the Sea Convention in 1982, there was great debate over the nature of the EEZ, and it was decided at that time that coastal states would not get a security interest in that zone, and that freedom of navigation would not be eroded in that zone, whether commercial aircraft or military vessels. And although uh, due regard will be required by user states, the coastal state does not enjoy any special security by operation of law. So, a statement by PRC's MOFAS spokesman in 2010, after U.S. Navy operations in the Yellow Sea, that China opposes any party to take military actions in their EEZ without permission is simply inconsistent with international law. And it also appears to be a standard that is inconsistent with the recent operations of PLAN ships in the EEZ of the United States off of Hawaii and Guam, and maybe recently in the waters of Australia or Indonesia. So in summary, my point today is simple. Meaningful adherence to international law and norms is our best chance of calming the waters of the Western Pacific. And any attempt to redefine clear legal norms relative to the exclusive economic zone or to restrict freedom of navigation and overflight are not helpful and should be resisted by the U.S. and other responsible actors in the region. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stu. Stu hit on a very important point. I'll tell you one other thing uh, I discussed with Admiral Wu uh, many times on the plane trip from San Diego to Washington. He said, uh, you Americans want to talk about freedom of navigation. You don't understand the meaning of the word. It's not freedom of navigation. It's freedom of passage. We have no issue with you passing through our EEZ from point A to point B. Just don't stop and loiter. That's your definition, freedom of navigation, stopping and loitering. I said, well, we operate with due regard, and so we're not going to go anywhere. Those are international waters. So these are things that we have fundamental differences on and that we've got to work through with the PLA Navy as we move forward. Dale, I'm going to ask you to wrap it up in the next seven minutes. Ladies and gents, we'll have 15 minutes for questions. I'm going to defer all mine to you and the audience. We're going to pass the mics out and let you ask. And uh, if we run out of time, we'll stay here afterwards, and we're willing to 
engage you in, in Q&A for as long as you'd like. Dale? Thanks, sir. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. My colleagues have mostly focused on the impact of the Chinese Navy in the Western Pacific region. It makes a lot of sense. This is where Chinese counterintervention, what we'd call A2AD capabilities, are focused, where the maritime claims uh, and the enforcement of those that uh, vexes our allies is, is really occurring. Uh, but I want to pull back a little bit geographically and look at perhaps how the Chinese think uh, or potentially think about blue water operations beyond uh, these near seas. Uh, and I focus on this a little bit because um, this is an area where uh, some very distinguished scholars who uh, think very deeply about what the Chinese are doing for their maritime claims in the near seas um, still are surprisingly dismissive of China's potential aspirations and reach out beyond the Western Pacific. Uh, in one case, describing the Chinese blue water capability as low-end capabilities relevant primarily for low-intensity peacetime missions in areas further afield. Um, this is a case where I think uh, we are perhaps uh, in this situation that Admiral Becker described uh, yesterday in the Information Dominance Panel uh, of not necessarily completely parsing what the Chinese mean when they talk through uh, some of their doctrine and, and some of their strategic intent. They'll talk very deeply about uh, their defensive strategy, but if you look at the China Defense White Paper, their annual authoritative statement of their planning and intent at the highest levels uh, for their defense policy for the year, uh, they point out that China's armed forces unswervingly implement the military policy of active defense. Uh, now, that's military operations in support of a strategically defensive intent. Defending your interest is usually defensive. Uh, but doing so under active defense through a variety of what look like very offensive means, in some cases almost preemptory means. Um, so uh, seizing on that defensive language, um, it's perhaps easy to neglect the parts of China's various authoritative documents where they talk about their intent to move out beyond the Western Pacific uh, into the blue water. The same defense white paper is good enough to call out the Chinese Navy's assigned training tasks in two groups, the near seas tasks and the far seas tasks. The far seas tasks are, and I'll, I'll quote a few of these, operating in complex battlefield environment, remote early warning, comprehensive control, which is to say C2, open seas inter interception, long range raid, interesting, anti submarine warfare and vessel protection in distant seas. Um, the, uh, the Chinese Navy, as it, as it thinks through how to implement these tasks, if you look at it from a Chinese standpoint, I think is really influenced by two potential pillars of thought. Um, the first is their assessment of what their own strategic interests are, and there are really three different ways this could play out, and it's interesting to watch as they think through this. Um, the Chinese are acutely aware of the vulnerability of the dependency of their economy on the international market, on the trade system that's established, on the flow of resources through the ocean areas. Um, and they see that both as the driver of the economic prosperity that underscores the party's survival, uh, but also as a potential vulnerability. Um, so um, in the most benign case, I think this could play out, the Chinese conclude that the international order that exists is really in their long-term interests, uh, not just in their interest for a limited period, uh, and that their military needs to contribute to the security and the preservation of that system. Uh, to carry out what Hu Jintao in 2004 gave to the People's Liberation Army as the new historic missions. Uh, the force that could carry out those missions in the blue water is still a non-trivial naval force, um, even if it, it moves there with an intent of preserving the international system. Um, it's possible, however, that Chinese leaders and planners will decide that the United States is not in a position to act as the Navy has for, for years as one of the principal guarantors of the international system China depends on. Uh, either uh, because we are a declining power, that is a common view in China and among Chinese leadership, eventually our resources will not support sustaining this international system, they'll need to be in a position to do so. Or on the other side, if you look at the potential for the United States to be independent physically of overseas energy, that the United States will simply lose interest in preserving the security of the sea lanes uh, that move energy to our allies and our trading partners. Um, and so China will need to develop a blue water force that's in a position to do this. In the worst case, um, the Chinese could conclude that they need to be able to preserve the movement of goods and services and across the oceans in direct opposition to the United States Navy. And you see discussion 
uh, in DC, uh, where I hang my hat at the moment, think tank circles, about the idea of a distant blockade on China, about the potential vulnerability of, of Chinese imports, which plays to a lot of their fears and perceptions already. Uh, and you can very much see how a prudent Chinese military planner would suggest that they at least need to hedge against this possibility, um, potentially by uh, being in a position to act against the U.S. Navy at distance from the Western Pacific. Um, that's the rational assessment. Um, the other thing that's factoring into the Chinese calculus is essentially their perception of their international profile and the Chinese Navy's role in that. Uh, in uh, November of 2012, uh, General Secretary Hu Jintao was, spoke to the 18th National Congress of the party, uh, one of his seminal speeches, where he talked about the need to develop a powerful armed forces that are commensurate with China's international standing. This was the same speech where he got a lot of attention for saying that China needed to be built into a maritime power. Uh, one of the, the, the justifications we've heard in a lot of circles uh, for China deploying its first aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, was that China was the only permanent member of the Security Council that did not have an aircraft carrier, and China's prestige required the development of an aircraft carrier. Uh, our Chinese counterparts are in some ways very traditional navalists. The Navy is incredibly popular in China. Um, and so whatever the rational strategic calculus is driving the expansion of the Chinese Navy, um, I can virtually guarantee that China's perception of its international standing will amplify that demand uh, as they're going forward. Um, so at bottom line, we are confident from the public documents that the Chinese Navy has a task to develop a blue water capability uh, that is endorsed by their senior leadership, uh, and that they are, as naval professionals, carrying that out to the best of their ability and the resources that they have, um, and that they're still in the process of, of working through long term what that blue water capability looks at. Um, it is a work in progress. Um, it has a couple benign outcomes, uh, but I will suggest to you that the trajectory that they're on is not encouraging that the, the benign outcomes will be uh, what they embrace. So, with that, sir. Dale, thank you very much. I can't underscore enough what Dale said about the popularity of the PLA Navy in China. If you ride the metro in Beijing, there are video cameras on every car. And the entire time that I was on the metro when I went down to Tiananmen Square, and the Forbidden City and back and around the ring, there was a tape playing of Chinese carrier operations. Captain Zhao Zhang, Captain Dai, the first tail hooker, Admiral Wu, President Xi out on ships, President Xi with naval troops. Very impressive. Didn't see anything about the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. Uh, additionally, uh, I, went, I went into a shop, it was a high-end shop where I knew I could find a price that was probably credible to buy some tea. While I was in there, there was a Chinese spokesmodel that wanted to show me a model of an aircraft carrier filled with their liqueur, Mu Tai. And it was the Yaoning, the jump jet, and it was like this long, porcelain with silver and gold, and they were very, very proud of it. It was worth over $2,000. She wanted to know if I'd like to buy it. And I said, no, I, I don't. We have 10 of them. We have 11 of them, and uh, we, we have plenty. Thank you. Anyway, so uh, let me open it up to questions. S sir. The uh, question I have is, most of what we talked about here today, the American public is inside baseball, uh, the first island chain, second island chain, easy, easy to PRC. But think of the threat of the PRC to the United States. It's the cyber threat that could undermine our intellectual capital, our technology advantages, and our own privacy with credit cards and that sort of stuff and the hacking. So the curiosity that I have is, and because I didn't hear any of you address it, is how the United States Navy can affect Chinese behavior in cyberspace. I'll let the uh, Intellians take that one. So, Jim, you want to answer that? Dale? I think uh, I'll take a crack at it. I'm sure Dale will help me out here, maybe. Uh, I think influencing China's not, can you hear me now? How about now? Now? You can hear me? Okay, good. Uh, I'd say that uh, the, the question raised is a really a serious area of, of consideration. So it's not just the kinetic uh, actions that I outlined in my speech. There, you know, there's more than just the ships at sea. Uh, it's the missile systems. It's the whole infrastructure that they have. But as we saw in this last year, 
uh, some of the reports that came out in the press from Mandiant and others about China's uh, cyber capabilities and the efforts that they're, you know, from a, from a military standpoint, they're investing in that part of the warfare. As Dave mentioned, you know, uh, across many spectrums. So what can we do to shape their behavior? Well, I think what I suggest in the kinetic realm is certainly applicable in the non-kinetic realm, which is to say we have to expose uh, these activities and we have to, you know, point out that they're doing this uh, and then, you know, work to the best that we can. And I think that's the, you know, the genius behind the formation of our information dominance core was to make sure that we're, we can defend ourselves. I'm not sure we can stop them from pursuing those activities. That's my personal belief. But we need to be aware of it, we need to call it out, and then we need to be able to defend our networks. Dale, anything to add? I will fall back on a little bit of, of DCEs and say this is, that's really obviously a whole government problem. What, what the Navy needs to be uh, prepared to do is to operate in the face of cyber as a contested domain and ensure that, as I think Admiral Harris pointed out, we measure our dependency and our ability to fall back elegantly um, to the essential command and control to conduct our operations. Sir, I, I just want to add in real quick. You're getting to the real point, and it's not just cyber. If you look at the South China Sea campaign, and they talked about this in Unrestricted Warfare, which has fallen out of favor, but they talked about military, non-military, old weapons, new weapons, cyber, financial. So this is a low level you're seeing in the South China Sea. If, if tensions get higher and we go into crisis, the war you're not going to see is the one you think you're going to see. You're going to see this hybrid war, and frankly, we don't have a lot of answers for it, and we got to think harder. We have point answers. You know, information dominance is working this answer, but we don't have a coherent ourselves, and the Navy's not thinking about this. So that's a major point. James. Uh, just two quick points. Uh, I'm not a cyber guy by, by trade, but I think that uh, we've heard the speakers all uh, call attention to the fact that this idea of ant access and anti-access is really, and, and even in my remarks, just because I was on such a short uh, time frame, I limited it mostly to the military dimension. This is not, this is not a military problem solely. It's a, I, I would say that anti-access is a, is a subset of a grand strategic problem called access which would involve uh, not only bringing in the cyber realm, but also thinking about things like diplomacy and economics and all of the things in international law and all of the things that we heard the other speakers uh, listen to. So that's point one. Point two is uh, we just happened in my seminar yesterday before I jumped on a plane and came, uh, came out of the snow zone into the sun zone. Uh, we got into a fascinating discussion in the context of the war on Al Qaeda about the nature of the cyber comments. We, we, we spend a lot of time talking about the sea as a wide comment, as my hand said. There's a, there's a big debate afoot uh, about to, to what extent the cyber comment is indeed a comment. And what's the, mood, the, what's the, the proper model for thinking about that, uh, about that domain of conflict and competition? Uh, is it conventional war? Does that provide the, the, the best intellectual guidance as we think about what to do in that cyber commons? My students suggested that you, counterinsurgency actually has some, has some significant uh, input to offer. This is why I love the seminar environment. You get new things out of the students at all the time. Or law enforcement, another, another potential model. We heard, from our, we heard from our lawyers down the table. So some things that uh, when we think about international treaties and institutions and whatnot, you can actually get a, you can actually get a fair amount of uh, value about thinking about it in those terms as far as the tools that are available to us to achieve our goals in that, uh, in that realm. Thanks. And your question is a broader picture of uh, anti-access area denial, cyber is a piece of it. Uh, while we were in China, Dale and I and the Vice Chief met with the uh, China Institute of Cultural and International Relations. A bunch of PhDs, they all were fluent in English. They formed the foundation of the intellectual basis for uh, feed to their future NSC. Really smart guys. So we, we, they told us from the embassy country team, ah, oh, this would be softball questions. We sit down with them for lunch, and one of the first things that came out of their mouth was, Hey, uh, we've read this article by a guy named Greenert and Walsh. It's called Breaking the Kill Chain. Uh, it, it seems that you, know, that you want to attack us. And I said, oh, whoa, whoa, that's about air sea battle. Breaking the Kill Chain is about air sea battle. It's a great article. I'm really glad that you've read it. I wish I could get more people in the United States to read it. It's not about China. It's about anti-access area denial. It's about the global commons, which begin outside 12 miles. We will not be deterred. We will operate there with impunity, just like you can. And anybody that prevents us from doing so will feel the wrath of air-sea battle to support our access and our maneuverability within the battle space. So they, they were quiet after that. Uh, Dr. Jack London, sir.
military context. Uh, Sun Tzu uh, approached uh, some of these matters from the standpoint of uh, knowing your adversary. Some might say know your enemy. Where do we think uh, in our planning uh, is the uh, end point or the goal or the objective of the Chinese government? Where, uh, we haven't spoken to that. What, what, are, what are they up to? Where are they taking this, uh, this, uh, their country, if you will? Sir, let me offer one viewpoint, turn it over to the panel. <clears throat> We've talked a lot today about uh, three elements of dime, uh, diplomatic, informational, and a lot on military. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about the economy. Last time I was in China, a very senior two-star admiral who was very eloquent, very well-educated, and uh, very understanding of Western ways, as I walked out the door, he said to me, by the way, Fogo Shangzhang, be careful what you do with your economy, because what you do will affect us. And that's the E piece that we haven't talked about. So when we look at a long-term plan, what are China's goals? Is it uh, to become a provider, a net provider of international security or an antagonist? Uh, I don't think we exactly know yet, but I'll tell you this, they like Proverbs. If I'm a loan shark and I loan you $100 and you default on the loan, you're in trouble. If I'm a loan shark and I loan you $1.3 trillion and you default on the loan, I'm in trouble. So that's how inextricably tied we are in the economy. Gentlemen, what do you say? Uh, I'll take a crack at it while well, well, my fellow panelists uh, gather their thoughts. Yeah, Sun Tzu, there's a, bit, there's a running debate on the, the extent to which Sun Tzu, this classical Chinese strategist, really shapes debates in, in modern China. But a lot of what he says is universal in context, so I think it's, uh, it's certainly appropriate to take that as a starting point. Uh, to, in order to respond to your question, I will invoke the greatest uh, strategist of our time, Yogi Berra, who says that prediction is tough, especially about the future. Very it's very tough to predict what's in some other, some uh, rival or competitive government's uh, mind. Having said that, I think that uh, in particular Jim Fennell uh, showed that uh, the Chinese are usually pretty good about uh, telling us what they want and what they intend to do. Uh, and just to, just to touch on something that Admiral Fogo said when we were talking about uh, access, about uh, freedom of navigation, the, if you talk, he, he's obviously been talking to the top level military people, but no matter who you talk to in China, they will tell you that uh, we don't care about obstructing navigation. But navigation means navigation, the right to pass through going from point A to point B, almost exactly what uh, Admiral Fogo said. So to, to me, the question is not so much access denial in military terms as it is partial access denial. Uh, essentially, if the United States accepts that, the, Ch the Chinese have essentially, essentially imposed on the United States a very difficult dilemma. If, in the value of the object terms, how much does the United States value everything other than freedom of navigation? Uh, for example, maritime territorial claims, the rights of allies, and so on and so forth. And that's, a, that's not something I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that we've uh, gotten our minds around. So in the sense that uh, the Chinese think in indirect terms, I think that's uh, uh, something to think about. Yeah. Gentlemen? I'd, I'd take a crack at just saying that um, I, I agree with the, the, the premise that Sun Tzu has, and I think the Chinese really believe that they can maneuver bring to bear all elements of national power to get what they want without firing a shot. But we also know that they've directed their military to be ready uh, because that's part of the pressure. And so their military is going to have the capability to be able to get them to achieve their goals. So the real question is, what is their end state? And they tell us. And they've told us in the last March, Xi Jinping said, we have a China dream. We want to be restored. We want to be rejuvenated to our rightful place. And so the question is, what are those elements of restoration? And part of it, from a naval perspective is, and what's of interest to me and I think this audience is, from a naval perspective, they believe that the first island chain is theirs, their territory, and they want to have it restored to them. So that's where the friction point's going to be. Um, I think it's very important that we look at I don't, I'm not, we're not sure exactly what their objectives are, but it's clear that we need more people to uh, study the language, study that and understand that. But it's clear they've read the influence of sea power on history and that they want to use maritime power to achieve their objectives. At the same time, I don't think they really read it because there's this part about the character of the government being a critical part of that. And if they don't solve that problem, that problem I talked about, their internal problems, uh, they believe if they drop below 7% growth, they're going to be in big trouble. Dr. Dave Finkelstein told us that a couple of weeks ago. So as we look at what they're doing, I don't believe they'll be able to sustain this expansion long if they don't come in line with uh, freedom, free markets, freedom, uh, 
complying with international norms, rules, laws, and standards. It, it's a Faustian bargain that they're, that they're, that they're taking. So that, that's on the positive side for us. They can't sustain this for long uh, if they don't change their internal constraints. We have a question back here. Back here. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, first is, what do we need to do or what event needs to occur to convince our Senate to ratify UNCLOSE? And the second one is, can we or should we try to implement a Inc. C type of agreement with China to prevent su incidents such as the Calpins? Um, <clears throat> let's do answer the unclosed question. I thought that was going to be a barrier when I went over there to talk to them about rules of behavior. They actually, the Chinese actually accept the fact that we haven't signed it, that we subscribe to it. And it was less of a problem than I thought. Uh, on the issue of Inc. C, Inc. C uh, is a throwback to the Cold War uh, between two superpowers and bipolarity. Um, we don't want to create that kind of environment in our relationship with China. We would prefer to have a peaceful rise and we would prefer to have more cordial-like discussions rather than something that is black and white, uh, as is the Inc. C agreement. So we're pursuing this dialogue on rules of behavior through the military maritime consultative agreement and other talks like the defense policy consultative talks. And from that falls out smaller working groups of lawyers and other naval officers to resolve the issues at sea. Stu, you want to add anything to that? Um, I would just say, um Admiral, that I think uh, all, all the, the last three administrations have been very supportive of UNCLOS, and all of those in the Executive Department, Department of State, Department of Defense uh, are supportive of, of the U.S. acceding to the Law of the Sea Convention. There are currently 164 nations that have acceded to the Convention, this Constitution of the Seas. Um, but I'm not, as you are aware, it has to be ratified by the Senate, actually acceded to at this point. And um, I'm not confident that we're going to see that in the near future. It is in the national interest of the U.S. to do it as soon as possible. Um, it, it prevents us from having to rely on customary international law. We do state that all of the, of the navigation provisions, as, as Admiral Fogo mentioned earlier, are reflective of customary international law. So we have that. But we're prevented from influencing some of the uh, administrative organs uh, related to the convention. We don't have a judge on the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. Uh, we can't submit a continental shelf um, to, to, to the body under UNCLOS. And, and then it goes to our lack of credibility when we talk about this. So I think there's overwhelming rationale to accede to the convention. I appreciate you bringing that up. Great question. We have time for one more and then we'll be happy to stay afterwards. Let me move over here, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's very uh, stimulating. Uh, I've been in China since uh, 2000, and I just really have a couple comments here. Uh, you know, Mao believed uh, in the fact that China should really control Asia. He also believed the United States should control only North and South America, and of course the rest would be Europe. So he, he saw these three areas. Um, China is, as you know, is building a very space-based uh, global military capabilities. Uh, so it's not only sea power, so we have to understand where that's coming. And I, I look at this and I say, you know, who's the enabler uh, behind China's aggressive growth? And the truth is, it's really the U.S. consumer. And uh, China has been preparing for global dominance as far back as the 1960s. And uh, I think we all know, and I know personally, uh, that uh, China is rapidly using stolen technology uh, to reach parity with U.S. forces. And as a final comment, which I, I think the panel has really been superb, by the way, is um, this is a Soviet-style government with a, a kind of a veneer of capitalism. And, uh, you know, we, we tend to analyze uh, China in our Western-minded thinking. And I think uh, one gentleman at the end, uh, I think he, he kind of hit some very good points looking at China historically. So uh, these are just kind of comments and maybe that might activate some, some comments, uh, you know, response from your part. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Great comments. And uh, I think uh, yeah, we, could, we could probably all talk to you for the rest of the day on, on each one of those eaches that you brought up. Uh, but let me throw it out for anything the team would like to say in response. Um, I would just like to say I think uh, Dr. Kissinger's recent book is, is good reading. Um, I don't personally believe that we have the irreconcilable differences with China that we had with the Soviet Union. I believe our differences are reconcilable uh, over time. I believe their internal battle that will go on is the most important one uh, as far as which way they go. But at the same time, we've never seen a China that has done very good at really being an expansionist power, taking over other peoples, despite what we're seeing in the East and South China Sea. China likes to consume cultures, intimidate uh, to get their way, and things like that. And that has to change. But at the same time, I don't think we're facing a, a threat of global domination or ir irreconcilable differences or an existential threat to US security uh, directly. Indirectly, yes, but not directly from China. And, and to that, if I may. So, and the issue of irreconcilable differences, I would agree with you, but um, we touched a little bit on what is China's desired end state, and I think, as we've said, they're very clear, at least in what they want to achieve, whether or not they have the means to ultimately go to it. You look at a variety of writings, the Central Party School writings, which are very, very authoritative, you know, the idea of national rejuvenation by the middle of this century, um, and what that actually means for the Chinese people. Um, the key question in my mind as an analyst is, do the Chinese, do Chinese decision makers believe there are irreconcilable differences? Is a China with its rightful place in the world consistent with the U.S. in a position that we believe is strategically and culturally important to us? Um, and so while we may not see irreconcilable differences, I suggest that debate's still going on in China, and we're not sure how that's going to turn out yet. And I, the, the last thing I would add is I just think it's important to see if they're going to adhere to international law. It's one thing to use the words of international law. It's another thing to act within the constraints of international law. And I think that's going to be a significant factor in the, in the next several years. I just make uh, one statement, which is you need to look at the strategic trend line. You need to look back 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20, 10, and then project out another 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 years. China has satellites in space. They're putting people in space. They're putting rovers in space on, on planets. They're sending you know, submerged vessels down to the bottom to the depths of the ocean. They're sending their fleets. You know, 10 years ago, if I told this audience that 10 years ago, China would have frigates in the Mediterranean escorting United Nations vessels that are carrying uh, chemical weapons from Syria, uh, you'd say you're crazy, okay? So it's all a matter of perspective, and it's all a matter of, you know, what China thinks is their rightful place. And so that should concern us, and we should study that. Thank you very much. And uh, that should wrap us up. We'll be happy to stay. I want to turn back over to Paul, and I want to thank the audience for coming today and your uh, wonderful questions and participation, and thank our panelists for a uh, job well done.